Hey, Dave DeWitt here, host and creator of the Invest Smarter podcast. And today we've got a great show for you. And the way that you will become a smarter investor today is that we're going to be talking with Rob Kessler, who is a serial entrepreneur who's got amazing business advice, who has run successful businesses in the past and currently runs a couple successful businesses. And for anyone out there who's interested in starting a business or having some inspirational stories that will help inspire you to start your own business, um, I think this interview will be a great one for you. And he is one of those guys that just gets things done. Uh, his, his big thing right now is the Million Dollar Collar, which is a really cool product that I can't wait for you to hear about. So let's just get right into this interview. Here's our conversation with Rob Kessler. Welcome to the Invest Smarter Podcast, where we'll simplify investing and provide actionable ideas to help you navigate the markets and own your future. From retirement planning strategies in plain English to timeless investing wisdom, we'll cut through the noise and leave you a smarter investor by the end of every show. All content within the podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decision making. So where do we start? Because I was looking through your uh, all your information. There's a lot we could possibly talk about um, that relates especially to our audience, kind of talking about investing, but also sort of inspirational stories and, and ways of investing in yourself, in your business, in the traditional sense that you know I do for a living. So you know what really fascinates me about your background is just the entrepreneurial drive. That it's pretty obvious looking at your uh, your background. So I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about, you know, currently what you're doing, um, your, your million dollar collar business. And I was looking at your website and I think I saw you sell a little, you know, thing. I'm not a huge into fashion or like that kind of stuff, but you sell little things to help the collar stay stiff. And do you actually sell shirts? So we do sell shirts. So, um, we have Calvin Klein, uh, Ralph Lauren, Tommy Hilfiger, uh, Van Heusen, Kenneth Cole. We have all those shirts. So, you know, my whole thing with business is try to make it as easy as possible for someone to try my product. And the challenge with Million Dollar Collar as it is, is it's sewn into the shirts. So you have to go get your shirt altered and have this added in. And, okay. you know, when we sell in 120 countries around the world, it's not an issue because they're used to alterations. In America, you buy a shirt and either it fits or it doesn't, you know, and you don't really, not a lot of, not enough people are tailoring their clothes to fit properly. So uh, it's a little bit more challenging here, but we're in 650 dry cleaners and tailors across the country. So, um, you know, we, we try to make it as easy as possible. So one of the ways is to buy a shirt you already know uh, with Million Dollar Call already installed. We have our own dress shirts called Go Tylus that are on the site as well. Uh, million dollar collar is, you know, added to any shirt that you already own. And then we've got a couple other accessories and things that we sell. Nice. So what exactly is, is it the million, the million dollar collar? So million dollar collar, think collar stay, except nine inches long. And it goes down the front of your shirt where your buttons and your holes are. So when you wear wow. a shirt without a tie, it, it stays up it's it keeps it from clump, crumbling it keeps it from collapsing you don't have to adjust all day especially when you wear uh you know a blazer or a jacket or anything this is what happens um you know this prevents that it gives structure to the part of the shirt that never had any you know so shirts were designed just, to be buttoned all the way up and worn with the tie so it's not just the collar then it goes down it's not in the collar at all, actually, oh. um, but okay. nobody knows what a placket is. So instead of us being called perfect placket and nobody knowing what it is, million dollar collar, one, rolls off the tongue and two, yes. at least puts you in the general area of the dress shirt or where it's supposed to be. So it's actually the weight of the collar that collapses the placket. So we are basically a, a, a support, a collar support. So holding up from the underside to keep the collar from collapsing the front of the shirt. Very very interesting that's really cool i'm a huge fan of um i guess last year before covid started i discovered this brand of shirt mizzen and maine that make this sort of athletic mm -hmm. shirt um i they're so comfy i'm just wondering like would, would it work with these sort of athletic dress shirts like i'm wearing one right now actually mizzen and maine and 
for being like so stretchy, it actually keeps its structure pretty well. Do you think it would work with, with that kind of Yeah, shape? I mean, it works with everything. We're talking to Miz and Maine about doing um, something with them. But, you know, if you unbutton that one more, you're going to see a big difference in the way that shirt sits. Oh, uh, yeah. I actually oh. find that their shirts are kind of soft. And yeah, so yeah, I I'm all about the symmetry. You know, you've okay. got one side that's kind of flopping and one side that's yeah. coming up and then folding over. So to me, oh, yeah. I just like the nice, clean symmetry. Um, and so that's what our product does. It doesn't matter the shirt. People are always like, oh, we'll buy better shirts. Well, better shirts typically have softer fabrics, which has less structure. That's, um, I mean, yeah. I personally install into celebrity shirts that are four or $500. I did a custom guy's shirt. He sells his shirts for seven to $1,200. And wow. they love it. I mean, it's, it's the shirts are just yeah. not designed to be worn without a tie and 90% yeah. of people, 90% of the time wear their shirts without a tie. So. Yeah. I hate wearing, I don't wear ties. I hate ties. Um, I yeah. see you hate ties too. Any particular reason why you hate ties besides them being terribly uncomfortable? Um, yeah. I, I just think they look stupid. I don't <laughs> like it. I, I, you know, I don't like having stuff around my throat too close, you know? Right. Um, uh, maybe it goes back to my car salesman days when I was 23 years old and forced to put on this tie, even if it didn't match what I was wearing. It was like, I don't care. Put on a tie. I'm like, yeah, this is stupid. I, I don't need a tie to like have someone think I have some kind of authority when they walk into the room. Yeah, I totally it's agree. Me. I trust me. I know what I'm talking about. I totally agree. I, um, I've been lucky enough to get away with never really having to wear a tie. When I first started in financial advising, I did wear a tie for certain meetings and stuff, but especially since COVID, things have just quickly shifted just to where casual is, is best. It's just even, even, you know, we have, we'll even talk to clients and they'll be like, Oh, I like that hoodie you're wearing today. Where it's like, yeah, it's like, we're just comfortable. You know, we don't, we don't need to look yeah. great. We don't need to look professional in the traditional sense to, uh, to do our best work, you know? So that's- Well, I'm sure. thinking who's still wearing a tie every day. It's politicians and lawyers. And I mean, do you really want to be associated with that group? I don't think so. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> well, you know, I, well, I'm in a business where you would think a lot of people still are. So I'm trying to associate mm -hmm. myself with the cool side of that group. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even a lot of finance guys are, are ditching the ties. I mean, yeah. you know, I did real estate for a long time and that is just an image business, you know, and it's just nobody in real estate's wearing ties except for the old guys. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, one direction I wanted to take this conversation was um, like growing up with my friends, you know, we would always come up with ideas like for some products, like a physical product, anything. And we you know we, maybe we'd even talk about it all night long, like while we're drinking or whatever. And of course, we're like thinking about how it could change the world. But then, like, it always ends there. So, like, you obviously have taken ideas to the next level. So, like, how would someone, if they had an idea, like, what would be like even a first step, to even see if it would be feasible? Well, you know, I think it's a passion question. Um, for this product, uh, you know, I came up with that on my wedding day. I got married in Jamaica. I came home and looked at my photos and my shirt just looked terrible on the biggest day of my life. And mm -hmm. so um, I literally cut open a shirt. I didn't know anything about the construction of a dress shirt, but I cut one open and shoved a piece of cardboard down the front and said, this is it. This is the spot that needs the structure. The collar was fixed a long time ago. And I showed it to my new bride and she goes, I get what you've been talking about for all these years. And so you don't have to, I mean, just like anything, the first iteration is going to be terrible, but if it gets you at least a little bit down the road to figure out what the problem is and what the solution you're coming up with is, then you can focus on the solutions. I knew the cardboard wasn't going to fit in a dress shirt and work in a dress shirt. Uh, so then I started cutting open any piece of plastic around my house I could find. And I'd wash it and dry it and see how it performed in the shirt. Mm -hmm. And then I'd send it to a dry cleaner and then it would completely melt to the shirt and ruin it completely. And so then I went to the plastics companies and just, I mean, the, that's the beauty of the internet today is you can find anything anywhere. So I Googled, you know, plastics companies. And so I searched for any plastic companies out there that had high heat resistant plastics. And so I'd order samples of those and try those in the shirt and then wash it and dry it. Great testing different lengths and designs and 
send it to the dry cleaner, it would melt to the shirt again. So, you know, after finding out that what the products that were out there weren't available, I did, you know, kind of eliminated all the other options. I went to a plastics company and said, here, this is what I need. Let's develop something that can work for me. And million dollar collar, as simple as it looks, is insanely highly engineered. It's soft enough to be sewn through with a regular needle. It's rigid enough to hold up the weight of the collar. It's heat resistant enough to double the temperature 400 degrees that they use at dry cleaners. I mean, it's got all of these contradicting properties, yet it works. And once it's in the shirt, it lasts the life of the shirt. It's amazing. That is that is pretty cool. So it sounds like you just you had an idea and then you just started doing stuff. Like you just actually got your 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 mind and body in motion trying different things as opposed to just sitting there thinking about it you actually start doing i think that's probably one of the keys yeah um, i mean look at anybody successful they say you have to be a doer i mean look i remodeled my entire house my first house that i bought was a 1927 bungalow duplex so i knew i had tenants downstairs paying the mortgage so i didn't have to worry about that payment i literally closed on that property and started bashing with a hammer an hour and a half after closing, taking out the walls. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I had a vision in my head of what I wanted it to look like. I watched home time, you know, Saturday morning after getting, you know, sleeping in, watching home time and home remodeling shows when I was younger. And in my mind, I knew what I wanted to do, but you know, I just, until you get into it, I think sometimes you just have to throw yourself in and then figure it out. You know, if you try to plan out everything, you're never going to make any, any, you know, progress. But for yeah. me, it's okay. I get in I figure out, I'm like, Oh crap, I need to do this. Okay. Well now I know I need to do that. Well, I can't leave a hole in the wall. So let's go figure out what that is and then do that and then keep progressing on. So, yeah, that's, the, that's a great quality. I mean, that's something I, I wish I had a little bit more of that in my bones. I'm someone that, uh, I hesitate to start cause I'm, I, I let the, the, the thought of the, of, the tremendous amount of work kind of, you know, be like, Oh gosh, maybe I should just hire someone to do this. But I mean, just starting knocking down a wall with a hammer. I mean, that sounds, to me, that sounds a little bit traumatizing if I'm being honest, but that's, <laughs> that's the difference between someone like you who's just constantly doing. And I guess me, but um, yeah, I, I would love to just one day, just like, I want to like redo my deck. I could just do it myself, I guess. Uh, or I could hire. Hey, look, somebody. you got YouTube University. Just go watch a bunch of videos That's right. and figure it out. I mean, yeah. if you got a drill and a saw, it, it's not, it, you'll figure it out. I mean, will yeah, it look great? Right. Maybe not. And then you can recut a board and try it again. And you know, I've got a big arch on my deck that I have to get around. I'm going to redo my deck soon. I've never done it, but you know, just try to figure out what the best way to recreate that arch is and get it as close as you possibly can. And right, sometimes just, it's better to just have something that's pretty good that you did yourself than just say, well, I paid someone to do that. Yeah. I think that's, I, really know, good. I like doing stuff. I think that's, that's great. I actually, I think I'm inspired now. I'm going to, I'm just going to go, there's one part of my deck, like the ramp. I'll start with something small, right? The ramp that's like rotting. So I'm going to just rip the ramp out, go to home Depot, get some stuff and just start trying. After I watch a few YouTube, we're sticking it. You know what? If you suck at it and you totally ruin it, then hire somebody. You've got a backdoor. You know, some, everything can always be fixed. Yeah. Unless you cut off a hand, you know, everything can be fixed. So, um, you now just try it, man. What's the worst yeah. that can happen? I'm going to give it a shot. Um, all right. So, let's talk about uh, your. I'm pretty impressed by this story of building a, a screen printing company and embroidery business from a spare bedroom at, and, and getting revenue over to a million. How quickly did you do that? Uh, it was about eight years, maybe seven or eight years. Um, yeah, I, I, I started a clothing company called Nude, N-E-W-D, which stood for nothing else will do. And I'd partnered with um, artists to come up with the designs and I was paying other people to screen print the shirts and I was paying absor exorbitant amounts of money. And again, I like to, if you can't afford to pay somebody else to do it, you better figure out how to do it yourself. So 
Uh, I happened to be out one night. I sponsored a new radio station in town, and one of the DJs said, "Hey, this meet my buddy Scott." Uh, Scott and I started talking, and I said, "Yeah, I want to learn how to screen print and this and that." He goes, "Oh, dude, I'm about to buy screen print equipment. Do you want to go in and pass on it with me? I'll teach you how to print." So met this guy two weeks later, we spent like $2,500 buying a starter pack of screen printing equipment. And he taught me how to do it. And I said, well, I guess since I have this, I should tell people I have it. Maybe I can help pay for the equipment. And uh, we're just kind of spread about our printing. And it just got to a point where I finally said, okay, well, I guess I'm a screen printer now because it was a lot easier than me trying to front $2,000 to buy a run of shirts than for someone to come to me and say, Hey, I need 50 shirts and it cost me a hundred bucks in materials. And I sell them to them for 500 bucks, you know, three days later, that was just a much better turnaround on the cash flow. So, uh, I fought it and fought it and fought it. I ran it out of my basement for the first several years. I probably did 30 or 40,000 shirts out of my basement before I wow. bought a 6,000 square foot building and moved into that. And my wife started her gym in that building. And so we had our offices together and then we rented out half of the building to other tenants and built that all out, did all that. So uh, one project is never one project with us. It's always like three yeah. or four or five. But again, it kind of goes back to you just started doing something and just led to one thing and then one thing led to another. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I had a duplex, so I had a tenant. I knew what that landlord life was a little bit like, but I didn't have commercial tenants. And so, you know, we just said, well, let's buy this 6,000 square foot building. And we almost had one guy rent the whole thing. And then said, eh, let's, let's subdivide it into eight little offices that are all prepaid. Everything is included in these offices. So we were one of the first ones to do these all inclusive offices and they filled up really, really quick. And we were getting up ex like crazy rents. We had an office that was three, uh, 95 square feet that we got $350 a month for that included internet shared internet included electricity it was like 95 dollars a square that's pretty that's tiny it's 10 by 10 not even 10 yeah, by 10. yeah. who was we got who three, 350 dollars a month for that office who would want to be in that all day long well so look at our thing was called our company was called get off your kitchen table and so we marketed to the people that were at a home-based business and wanting to have their first office and maybe start meeting some clients outside of their home. But when we were looking, it was like, well, okay, well, the rent is this. Well, how much is internet? How much is electricity? How much is this? You have all these variable costs. And I said, well, it's a lot easier for me to know as a businessman that's just trying to expand that I have a fixed bill every single month with no variables. and I don't have to worry about anything. And I just know that that's what my cost is. And so we said, well, let's make these off. They were 350 to like $800 a month, depending on the size and everything was included. And I'm telling you, they rented out like instantly, like really, really fast. Um, and it was just, just the way we marketed it to people. That's, that's a pretty, that's an interesting marketing pitch. I think that wouldn't like, if I was on my own at home, I think that would probably, probably be enticing for me, even at this stage when everyone's working at home only because you start to get a little bit home crazy, stir crazy at home uh, when, you know, your baby and, you know, wife are upstairs and, you know, then they're yeah. always on your neck and then, but yeah, then being able to go out, even now I kind of like would miss going out a little bit. Um, just I mean, look, if you had an office that was three, 400 bucks a month, you wouldn't worry about, you know, being there every minute of every day, but saying you got a client, it's like, Hey, come meet me down in my office. And you have your own lockable room with your stuff and it doesn't have to be big. I mean, 10 by 10 is a nice office size. I mean, my, this room is yeah. a bedroom. It's a little bigger than that. You go in, you get your business done. You go, I mean, we had a massage lady in there. We had a lady that did Botox. We had, um, I mean, we had all kinds of different businesses yeah. in there. And so they were anywhere from 95 to 300 square feet, depending on what you wanted. But I don't know, work yeah. for us. We ended up buying a second building that had, 20 offices in a different town we built out added two more offices to that i bought that building for 116,000 square feet i bought for 160 grand i put 100 grand into renovating it filled it and sold it for 450,000 in 13 months all right so that's what's that, like almost like a 60 70 percent return <laughs> that's pretty nice 
That's not, that's good. So what, so what led you to selling the printing business? Just all this other business was taking more of a, taking more of the, the focus. No, I, I took my wife to Los Angeles for her birthday. Uh, we went to the American Horror Story premiere party. I had a friend that worked in the industry and got us tickets. And we came home from that trip and she said, let's do it. And I said, okay, when? She said, by my next birthday. So we Wait, do what move? uprooted. Oh, yeah. We uprooted from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where we knew everybody. Oh, so that's where you were uh, with the sold real everything estate. we had. Okay. So yep. you're in you're in Milwaukee. Sold everything we had in sorry. Yep, Milwaukee and Green Bay in Wisconsin. We sold everything we had in 2015 over the course of that year. I closed down the screen printing business. I sold it to one of my clients about 30 days before we moved. And 362 days after her birthday, we were in the car with everything we owned moving out to Los Angeles, where we know absolutely nobody. So how do you like it out there? That's why I sold the business. I loved it. We loved it. We're in Atlanta, Georgia now. Okay. Um, but we, uh, we loved Los Angeles. We went there for opportunity. We went there to meet people. Uh, my wife had her gym in Milwaukee and she was getting a little burned out from it. And she thought she was going to be able to work at like beach body corporate. She was modeling for matrix and Woodway and like major, major, uh, fitness brands. She was in the insanity DVDs. Um, so she was doing all this stuff and we thought, well, we have some, you know, potential out here for her to do that. I can do, I had already invented million dollar collar was just kind of getting that started. So I knew what I was going to do. And, um, she ended up, the only people we knew were the leasing guys in the front office of our apartment building that were like half our age. And so we were hanging out with them one day and on a walk with our dogs. And the guy was like, Hey, uh, one of our former residents is a stunt man. Do you want to meet him? And you know, my, now my wife is one of the top stump ladies in, in the industry. She's here in Georgia. Uh, she's worked on Captain Marvel and Tenant, and she doubled Taylor Swift and uh, wow. Grey's Anatomy, Last Ship. I mean, she's done tons. So that's really cool. I mean, you could spend a lot of yeah, time so we about doing that. that. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that for days. Yeah, so. wow. That's like how dangerous are the stunts that she does? Like, what's the most dangerous stunt she's done? So the most dangerous one she did was on a movie called The Curse of La Lorena. It was by the same guy that did Saw James Wan. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, his style of movie. And so she was supposed to be on what's called a ratchet. So there's a wire attached to her back and they're going to yank her. And so this lady was supposed to like fly backwards. So she went nine feet in the air, 20 feet back on two inches of just kind of roughed up ground. And, you know, if you over rotate, you can snap your neck and oh. be paralyzed. So she did the stunt. They had to do it twice. And then it never even made it in the movie. Oh, no. <laughs> so How, How'd you feel yeah. about all that? <laughs> you know, she, she didn't really tell me. She didn't sleep the night before. She's really nervous about it. But, you know, they do everything they can to be as safe as possible. And you still um, get she'll paid. Do, she did a, oh, yeah, she gets paid. Um, and she gets her residuals from it after the fact, but like she, um, on a lifetime movie, she had to dive out of a second story window in a wedding dress and flip and, you know, land on the ground wow. it was into an airbag, but you know, that dress could have got caught on the way out. So she just did one for Nickelodeon where she's, you know, on the rooftop for a Christmas movie where she, you know, rolls off the roof with lights all over her and stuff. So it just never met, never, you know, never know. Every day is different. So. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I've never met someone that knew, let alone have has their wife be a stunt woman. Um, yeah. Wow. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really cool. So, so when did you actually launch the Million Dollar Caller then? Because you said you had the idea when you moved out to Los Angeles. <laughs> so we got married in 2013. It took me three years to patent and perfect the product. Uh, and we launched in January of 2016. So we're a little over five years of sales. We're coming up on 400,000 units sold to people in over 120 countries. So it's been, uh, it's been quite a ride so far. So, so business is good. This is good. It's cranking. It's, it's starting to hit a couple strides. You know, we're, we're still waiting on the working on the, you know, landing the big dog that we licensed this to, and it just is in all of their shirts, but 
in the meantime, which you, which you can't, which you can't, which you can't tell me who it is. Uh, you know, we're talking to everybody. We were, we were very, very close on a deal with express, uh, in October of 2019. And then, you know, the world came to a screeching halt. And, uh, so it was the perfect storm of bad things to happen to that deal, but that would have been a game changer. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, there's my, my technology is one of those things that it should just be in every dress shirt because there's no reason not to, uh, you can still button up and wear a tie. You can go tieless. You can dress it any way you want. It doesn't really affect the performance outside of, you know, what it's intended to do. So you can still wear a shirt like normal. So yeah, that's what our goal is. I think I'm going to buy a couple, um, just try and you think it like, if, if I'm, if I know how to sew decently, I can just sew it on some shirts. I don't care too much about. Yeah. I mean, Tessa, if you've got a sewing machine, it's, it's an inch of stitches. So if you can sew a straight line for one inch, you're fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's, I taught myself how to sew. I can do any shirt in less than five minutes. Most of our tailors laugh when I ask how hard it is. They're like, dude, a button is the only thing that's easier to do than this. They can do five, six shirts in 15 minutes. I mean, it's insanely easy to do. And uh, it, it just dynamically changes the way a shirt looks. Yeah, I'm going to just get some and just do it because I have, I bought a few shirts recently, just some like, just from like Kohl's, like some decent, like, uh, sleeveless or not sleeveless, um, short sleeve button ups that just are, you know, just so soggy, just so, you know, you can really freshen them up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, look to me, you know, I have been in the clothing industry for so long and look, that stuff is insanely marked up. If you want the best dress shirt for the money, it's a Kirkland Costco dress shirt. It's the exact same shirt that comes off the production line of Nautica that are $80 retail shirts you can buy it for $17.99. So you go buy an $18 shirt, you put in, even if you have to pay to have million dollar collar installed for 10 bucks, you got $28 into a shirt. You can even have it tailored for another 10 bucks and have a custom fitted shirt for under $40. That's got an amazing quality that looks great. I mean, to me, that's the way to go. Well, I you, buy, because of my screen printing life, I buy all blanks. I don't buy branded anything. I don't spend more than four or five bucks on a shirt and I get really nice quality shirts. Oh yeah, that's smart. Yeah, well, like Cos well, Costco, Kirkland, everything is pretty good. I gotta say. Yeah. Um, they only take a twenty percent margin. They don't care. They they're a volume company, so they can buy enough. They can they twenty percent. So, you know, those shirts are incredible for the for the price. I mean, you could just buy those in bulk and put your things on them, and then just sell them. I'd rather sell them to Kirkland and have them just put them in the factory, but that's I have true. To buy well, I'm, I'm digging it. I'm digging it. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking if I was going to do this and compete with you, that's what I would do. Mm. You have the patent. So I don't even know if I could do that. Cool. <laughs> so you can buy them from me and then do whatever you want. If you sell yeah. product, I don't care. You just don't re don't try to recreate my product. That's it. Right. Yeah. So, how, so the patent process, how did that go? It's is brutal. It, it is absolutely brutal. There's nothing fun about it. All you do is write checks and you know, the guy quoted me 20 grand to get this patent and I'm over a hundred and over a hundred grand into it. So um, the, the thing with patents is, is your attorney is going to write it as big as he possibly can to cover as much as they possibly can. And the patent office is, wants it to be as narrow and refined as possible. So it's this ongoing battle. And so right out of the gate, the first question is, do you want to expedite this process? If no, every time we submit, it's going to be six months before we get a response. If yes, it's six weeks till we get a response. And that time gap costs you $3,500 right out of the gate. And so of course I wanted to expedite this and move it along faster. So he writes it this big, they say no. He writes it this big, they say no. He writes it this big and they say, okay, we're really close. He writes it this big and they say, okay, you're good. And that took three years. That's crazy. Cause I hear like, I watch shark tank and they make it seem like everyone's got a patent and that it was no problem to get the patent. Unless I'm just reading it, reading into it. I guess, I guess the judges always seem to have placed a lot of value on the patents, which I guess there yeah. clearly is once when you think about how much money you pour into just getting patent. Wow, that's well, and you can do it. I mean, look, Sarah Blakely from Spanx did her own patent. Can you do it yourself? Absolutely. But I knew I was going to commit my life to bringing this product to the market in a, in a wide way. 
And I didn't want to risk going through all that on my half-assed version of what a patent is. So I found the, the biggest firm in town, the most experienced with the most backing and said, let's do this. And I knew I was committing, well, what I thought was 20 grand. Um, I knew I was going to commit a lot of money to it, but I knew it was going to, going to protect me in the long run. So what most people don't understand is the patent ends up becoming another source of revenue for people. Because when people start infringing and they have to pay these patent fees uh, or infringement fees, that's another revenue source. So it can pay for itself eventually. Okay. I see. Um, I wanted to go back for a second to your business and just ask like, how, how did it go with COVID? Like I imagine maybe there was, cause just with the, the trend of people wearing more casual clothing, but I guess maybe it didn't hurt as bad as I would assume. So we have two businesses right now. We have go Tylus, which is our dress shirts and million dollar collar, which is the technology and go Tylus had just launched in December uh of 2019 so it was what we thought was going to be terrible timing but what turned out in our favor is everyone stopped advertising on facebook when COVID hit and so mm -hmm. our facebook ad dollars went three to four times what they used to when we actually sold out of our almost 80 percent of our inventory to the point where it was like you got one small slim nothing from you know no large no extra large it was it, it was a good and a bad thing Million dollar collar really, really slowed down, but uh, overall it worked out all right. And, um, you know, we came out and, and like you said, now it's, I think business casual is like the standard. Um, I think people have been wearing t-shirts and sweatpants and hoodies for long enough. They're starting to feel like, look, I'm, I need to put on some clothes. Um, and I think people are gonna be getting back to the office sooner than later. I like the energy of being in a space. I was very successful in real estate at 24 years old because I was in an office with a hundred people and I was hanging around people that knew what they were doing. They've been doing this for years and getting business from them and getting ideas from them and getting opportunities from them. You can't do that when you're sitting off on your own, you know, by yourself, you just don't, the synergy just isn't the same. So I think the creatives are really looking forward to getting back into the office and you know, hopefully with uh with the dress shirt on million dollar collar installed yeah i hope for i hope for your sake for sure yeah so it sounds like things are picking back up which is which is great um i mean i know i like for a while i would just i only wore t-shirts and sweatshirts but even now i'll just randomly even though i'm in my house i'll just randomly put on a dress shirt for the day just just to feel a little bit more feels good you know yeah. it feels it i think it changes your mentality uh, a little bit just changes the psyche so sometimes it's good. Sometimes what you need. Yeah, for sure. And I would like to get back to the office, but my office is small and it's just my old man, our secretary, and then our other guy who we work with is an, is is remote in New Jersey. So it doesn't always feel. You no, know, I love the. I used to work in a in a at a company where it was an open floor plan, and there'd be like 200 people on the floor, all your buddies and everyone, and I miss that that energy and just, you know, going and just seeing people every day. You're right that it really, there's something to it for sure. But whether I'm at my house or in my office, I don't necessarily get that. I've actually found for me personally, I've been more productive at home just because I kind of get in that zone sometimes. Um, but I think there's definitely production advantages because you can just get right to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the creativity overall is lacking right now uh, because there isn't the, the big group yeah. settings anymore. Yeah, I guess that, so yeah, so I, I see a lot of big companies are really doing crazy things to incentivize people to come back. And I guess from their perspective, it must be like, wow, you know, we don't want to force them back because they're so happy at home, but we know that for the long run of the business and the productivity and the innovation of our business having people here is probably better yeah um let's see what else could we talk about um so you know, when i talk to some like i talk to some entrepreneurs and they now this is going to be a little change of subject they uh a lot of entrepreneurs i talk to they're very, they like just being in control of like their money, their cash flow. 
their they like to know that they're what they're doing so a lot of them are like against like like the stock market because they feel they don't have control and they don't they don't want to just put their money into something that they don't know you know they their their level of productivity is not going to change how their 401k does any given year um do you take that view or are you more of someone who still siphons off some to the side for like that that long-term nest egg yeah, I'm diversified. I mean, because I've had so many different jobs, I built a little 401k pot and, um, you know, I moved that over to our management company and uh, I redirected where I wanted most of it to go. Um, it turns out I am now have the number one um, uh, stock that's on the uh, low ball thing, whatever, like the... On the what? Uh, uh, where they're trying to short it. I have the, so it's called um, On Track. Okay. Started by uh, uh, Pizer, Darren Pizer. The, and so the I've company got, stock is called On Track. Yeah, it was, it's the number one short sale stock that's on the, on the target list, apparently. Oh, like the Reddit, um, the whole Reddit thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, <laughs> I mean, it was, I think I bought at 12, it went to 99 and it got back down to about 15 or 18 and now it's in the thirties. So, uh, but it's a great technology. So, you know, I've got a little control over that. I know long-term what I want to do with that. Um, I've got a little bit of money into um, another little group one, but, you know, I think long-term you have to diversify. I can't rely solely on what I'm doing. Sometimes it's nice to just pull a little aside, but I do like the fact that, you know, like with our yacht charter business, I know that if I put in this effort that I'm going to get paid that amount of money. So I like the direct input and output, which yeah. is why, you know, I started the screen printing business or through that. Because, yeah. Yeah, I see that a lot. Bucks in, five hundred bucks out. It's great. So mm -hmm. right, you know, you just you know, you know, you know, you know your outcomes based on your your work, your work, and I guess a little luck here and there, but yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, too, I mean, you need to make money while you sleep. The problem with my wife as a stunt woman is, I mean, while she does get residuals, they're not nearly as much as the payday off the bat. But when she's not working, she's really not earning. So you can't ever have wealth if you don't have money generating money while you sleep. So you have to find ways, whether it's real passive. estate or stocks or some kind of passive income. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully you can get your passive income to out, outdo your, your, yeah. your earned income. Yeah. And then you're in a really, really good spot. Yeah. Well, one issue we do see with some entrepreneurs that have everything in their business is when it comes time to actually want to retire and sell you, how, if there's a transition period, if it's the timing's not right to sell, um, then you, how are you, you know, you might be forced into waiting or not quite having the extra money on the side to still go into a retirement while you're waiting to sell your business and figure that out. So, but, but yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's that diversification. You've, you've got to have different money coming in. You can't rely. I mean, I want to invest in myself. I know what I'm capable of. I mean, look, three years ago, my wife and I sold our two commercial buildings with 40, 31, 32 tenants. We sold that and bought a yacht to start a yacht charter business in Los Angeles with no base, no nothing. And we're not, now we're in the process of selling that three years later for a, a great price. We built an amazing business off of it. We know what we're capable of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, clearly what for you, once I feel like once you've had a, a few small wins and you start just, and you just start to understand business and you start to understand the marketing and how to, how to, you know, just what you're doing it. So, you know, for someone like you, like, why would you not primarily invest in yourself while you're certainly ready and willing to go, 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 you know? Yeah. We like to find a niche and then just exploit it and then you know we like to to build the foundation find the business and then we're really bad at hiring we have a really high standard that we hold for ourselves and we have a hard time translating that so we like to start something get it going get it profitable and then sell to somebody who wants to grow it and, and can expand on the idea so 
uh, I think we've, we're selling our third or fourth business now at the end of this month. So yeah, that's really cool. So tell me a little bit about the yacht business. Did like, did, was there any point where you were actually the one I see, maybe are you a licensed captain or something? Like, were you actually taking people out? Yeah. Yeah, I did most of it. I mean, and COVID actually was uh, amazing for our business. We were shut down for the first month in April. We didn't know what we were going to do. We thought we were going to have to live on the boat. Uh, we didn't want to leave Los Angeles. Um, so we were planning, you know, we had four different plans of what would happen depending on what happened with our businesses and our cash flow. Uh, they opened us back up at 50% capacity in April, and then it just went insane. Um, so we grew 250% last year over 2019, uh, and we're up 350% this year over last year. So it's, it started yes last year and is in, it's just, it's a rocket ship right now. I mean, people are learning about the industry. There's more companies out there offering things. Um, and we went from a tourist based, uh, clientele to a local based clientele, which was great because now we have a lot more referrals coming in. Yeah. You know, unless somebody from your town that you know is happening to go to LA and happens to be have been on our boat, probably not going to book us. But you know, if you live there and you tell all your neighbors about it and how you had a great time, you know, it's a good chance you're going to come out. So it's been crazy. That's cool. Like, what what is what is the average? Yeah, you're ringing the register at a after amazing growth. But um, what what is like the average? Uh, your average customer, like, what do they want to do? Just go out on the yacht for a while? Like, like what, like, what do you think? That's what, that's what separates us. Every other boat is like, okay, we're going out per hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, whatever you want to do. It's, it's just a time and it's just a vessel. We said, let's just build it out. We found this amazing website called the climb C L Y M B. And it is fully itinerary adventure vacations. So like we went to Vietnam a few years ago, both of us for 10 days from the minute we landed to the minute we left, everything was paid for, for 2,500 bucks for 10 days for both of us. And so all we had to do was get there and get home. And we loved the idea of, look, I don't know what to do. Like I'm coming to a new area. I don't know anything about Vietnam. Show me what I need to see. And we love that itinerary idea. So what we did is said our original boat name was LA boat excursions. Cause we were going to have these planned out excursions. And then we learned that, you know, there's 10 other businesses that have LA something in their name in the boat business. So I didn't want to get lost in that mix. So the name of the boat was Bella. So we just called it Bella boating, which is really easy. And alphabetically it's on the top of the list. So we have a two hour Marina or ocean cruise. We have a three hour uh, coastline cruise where you see a bunch of the coast. We have four hours where we go, and drop anchor at Malibu Pier and grill out burgers and blow up floaties. That's Five hours awesome. where we go to Paradise Cove. We've got Catalina Island. So everything, like you want to go for five hours, this is what you're doing. If you want to go for four hours, this is what you're doing. And all the guest work's taken out. Our pricing is all inclusive. Everybody, like I hate being nickel and dimed. So everybody else is like, okay, here's the boat fee. Here's the fuel fee. Here's the captain fee. Here's the wharf yeah. fee. Like we were, we started at, $325 an hour to just get every ounce of business we could and slowly increase the price. And now we just bumped again, we're $550 an hour and we charge more than boats that are 15, 20 feet bigger. And people leave ours and say, dude, uh, this is, I had a guy who is big time in New York. He's like, I can go to any Michelin star restaurant. I can have the chef come out and talk to me at a Michelin restaurant and you guys provide better service. And for 500 bucks an hour, $550 an hour, I can show up with my family or with a client and know that I'm gonna get impeccable service and walk away and I, I don't have to do anything. For two grand or 1500 bucks, I can have a great time, show my friends a good time and leave and know that everything was taken care of. And that's what we do. Well, that's a great endorsement. That's a great, that's a great review. Um, great customer service amazing customer service is never forgotten. Really. You always remember when nope. you had your best experience with something. So that's really cool. Is $500 per person per hour? Or just no, for the boat? $500 an hour for up to six people. And then a hundred dollars per person up to 12 people. Okay. That doesn't, 
for for that one, that five hour one where you go grill burgers and get the floaties out, that sounds like that sounds fun. That That's sounds our fun. number one in the summer. So last year, you know, we were five hundred bucks an hour. That was twelve people for five hours is a little over three thousand bucks. That's a lot of money for a lot of people. That's a lot of money for me. I wouldn't spend three thousand dollars for five hours to do a thing, but because I don't know if it's because we're from the Midwest, but my wife and I feel this responsibility. If someone's going to spend that kind of money with us, we want to make sure that it is a ridiculous experience that they leave and feel like they really, really got their money's worth. And so if you see our reviews, you see the business that we built, you know, it shows that it is still really great value at $500 an hour. And if you see our client list, you'd be like, okay, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's that's really cool. That sounds almost like that'd be like a cool like bachelor party idea. Bachelor parties, we have a lot of bachelor parties, birthday parties. Um, I mean, some people are just like, look, I gotta get out on the water, man. I just want to go have a fun day on the water and to be able to show up to something and all they have to bring is that whatever booze they want to drink, everything else is taken care of. Like every other boat, it's like, yep, the boat's here, but you gotta bring plates and knives and forks and cups and ice and we have all that stuff. Just yeah. show up, have a good time, and go I'm, home. I'm looking at your website yeah. now. Is, is that boat the is that is that the boat? Do you have more than one boat or just one boat? Yep. No, we just have the one. It's a nice boat. Yep, 50 foot Sea Ray. It's beautiful. And so every other boat in that we compete with is usually a two story where, you know, they're they're really practical boats and they have a lot of inside space. But look, you're booking us to be out on the water with your friends. I've been on 55, 60 foot boats that are not my style of boat that you can't fit 12 people around the table. We can fit 12 people around the table on our 45, 50 foot boat. And I mean, you think you're going out with your friends, you want to be with all your friends outside in the sun together. You don't want to be all sporadic all around the boat. So yeah, yeah. Um, we, just, we just saw the style. We thought it was better. It was different than every other boat that was out there, found our little niche and just carved out and worked it that's awesome that's really cool um yeah i'm gonna be sure to get some of those plackets and um, maybe uh for uh maybe i'll plan a trip out there before we, but you're gonna sell it so but either way yeah, we're, we're a week away from closing so you won't see okay. me out there but we'll you see know, the you. new owners are gonna take over they they know what we're doing and why we're doing it they're gonna do a great job all right sweet all right so we're running low on time why don't why don't we end it by, by you just sharing um, any last words or maybe um, giving some advice on for someone who maybe want to start a business? Because I know we, we like, do like to have some, uh, we do have some, we like to have people that are very entrepreneurial and, you know, go-getters. So if you have any advice for those kind of people. So one, um, you know, do it for the passion. Don't do it for the money. If you're chasing dollars, you're going to give up. Uh, there's a famous story about the Wright brothers and how they were in competition with another guy that was said he was going to come up with manned flight first. And he had all this money and all this publicity. The Wright brothers had nothing except passion and they came up with the first. And he literally walked away after they flew. He walked away and said, well, I, if I'm not going to be first, I don't really care and burned a ton of money. Uh, but he didn't have the passion. So you have to have the passion, especially when the times get rough and they get uh really, really challenging. And I mean, there's been plenty of times where I'm like, dude, what am I doing with my life? Um, and so if you're not passionate about what you're doing, you're, you're probably going to fail because you don't have the drive. Um, two is keep your name out of your business for the love of all that is holy. Uh, you can't sell Linda's personal training to Mike because who, who who's Mike? I, I've come into Linda's personal training. So I've seen so many companies where they try to like, you know, John Co. or something like that. Like you can just tell they're just trying to get their name in the business somehow. And it's like, set your ego aside, have a plan to grow a business and sell it. Like you have to have an exit plan. And to me, having your name in the business is very challenging to have a, a good exit, smooth exit plan. Hmm. Um, you know, and I just, just, just love what you do, man. I mean, I, I, if you don't love what you do, it's just going to be challenging. I think that's the biggest thing. Find mentors, I guess would be the last. I mean, I'm fortunate that my dad is a very successful businessman. But it wasn't always that way. I mean, we were dirt, dirt poor when when I was young, 
uh, we didn't have anything. So, you know, he built it from nothing and I, I got to watch that. And I, now I have him at, on my side, but when I got to LA, I met a guy who, or we met a girl who was going on a hike that got me into a men's networking group. And I surrounded myself with insanely smart people and you have to put yourself out there. I love being the dumbest guy in the room because I'm going to get something from somebody. Somebody, I mean, if somebody's willing to talk to me, I can tell them what I'm doing and hopefully I get a good piece of advice from somebody. Yeah. So, um, you know, networking is great. I don't want it networking. Like here's my card. I'm going to sell you my services. It's, yeah. you know, what can I do for you? How can I help you? What, what can we do together? Um, and that was really, really helpful is having mentors. One of my closest friends now uh, was one of the founders of Expedia.com and he's always there to help me. But he also knows that if I take his time and say, hey, I need some advice that I'm going to follow it and I'm going to follow through. And he's always there for me because I've proven that he's not wasting his time with me. That's the worst thing you can do with a mentor. Somebody who's made it and has time, that's the most you know valuable thing to them. Linda became such a successful stunt woman because she asked so many questions. Who do I talk to? What do I do? And then she would do it and go back to them and say, Hey, I did what you said. Uh, do you have any other advice for me? And they're like, what? You did what I said. Nobody does what I said. Yeah. I got more advice here. Go meet this guy. And then they'll put themselves out for you more and more and more and, and give you better referrals because they know that you're going to follow through. That's really great advice. That's great advice for me too, personally, because um, I'm in a family business and I'm in a stage where I'm trying to grow it, market it and um, do all those kind of things. So I think that's great advice for me and for a lot of people probably listening. But Rob, thank you so much for coming on. I thought that was a really fun interview. Um, I appreciate it. Let's, um, let's stay in touch. I'll follow up with you uh, in a little bit. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been awesome, man. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye. Email us at investsmarterpod at gmail.com with questions to be highlighted on the show. Thanks for listening and keep investing smarter.